going to present you um, this, uh, this short uh, story. Uh, first of all, but we heard it already, we know it already, if you think about e-health, think about something like that. It's a huge puzzle with a lot of pieces and everybody is part of one of these pieces, working on one of these pieces, but you have to fill everything together to get the, the complete image. And since we only have 20 minutes, uh, brace yourselves because I'm going to be pretty quick. You have question time at the end if you want, uh, but uh, we're going to go over these four chapters. The first two ones are the most important ones. The, the first one they asked me to explain a little bit how our system is working as far as medication is concerned, prescriptions and everything that turns around it, um, and also how we are working to improve the system for the future, and that's the, on, amongst others the VDIS project, but also some other projects and plans that we are working on. The last two ones are little add-ons. These are, uh, I would say, my personal opinions, how I think that we should tackle a number of very basic problems that you might recognize also. By the way, who is from Belgium? Who knows the Belgium situation? One, two, three, yes, all the other ones, right, uh, I hope uh, you can follow. So the first one, a puzzle of four services around medication. Before I start, one look at this here. This is the Belgian portal, myhealth.be, mijngezondheid.be, masante.be. You can consult it in four languages if you want. This is a portal that the authorities made and where the patient now has access to almost all of his data. I would say 98%, I think, of his data can be accessed there. And it's a portal also. So the same as we saw in the presentation from Denmark earlier, a portal for patients in this case. What we don't have in Belgium is a portal for the healthcare providers. That's one of our weaker points. But all that we will see also is present here. But it's like a puzzle, different small pieces that don't really fit together. You have to go from one piece to the other. The portal doesn't contain any data. The data are stored uh, in, a, in a distributed way. Of that portal, these are a number, not even all, of the different platforms, the different partners that work on this platform. A couple of them are only as advisors, like the patient organizations that you see here, but, uh, but also a lot of platforms from hospitals, from uh, primary care and stuff like that, where you have the, the data. And to make things even more, uh, more complex, you have the Belgian landscape, the political landscape. Belgium is a federal state with communities, with regions. Uh, it's it's a, also a puzzle on its own. And every one of these parts has their own little system and wants to have their own little piece of the puzzle also. And that's, that's good on one hand, because that means that they have their own rhythm of development. But on the other hand, if you really are a patient, certainly if you living somewhere on the, on the border region between these different uh, parts of, of Belgium, uh, then you have a big problem because you have to, s to go from one system to the other. Your healthcare provider also has to go from one system to the other. And this is the last one. Keep that one in mind. These are the recognized software packages in Belgium, right? For doctors, pharmacists, dentists, uh, physiotherapists, uh, nurses, midwives, dietitians, hospitals. And on the right there, you see all the different serv services that we have. So for the moment, you have a lot of different services. As I said, parts, separate parts, where you have to go for your different uh, uh, data if you need it. Now, let's take a closer look, as I promised, at how it works for medication. I was very pleased to hear in the introductory sessions that in many cases they start with prescriptions and medicines, and somebody said because they're available, and somebody else said because they're simple. It's true. It's available because we all work with prescriptions. It's pretty universal. And it's also there and, and readily available. One of the reasons, I think, is that in Belgium, for instance, uh, when I was very young, in, uh, in the 80s, we started coding medication, and we have been coding everything in the meantime. So the pharmaceutical part of e-health is one of those that has been coded for decades already, and that means that it's easier to work with. Nevertheless, it took a long, long time, it took about 10 years, to go from more or less a paper prescription. This is already a prescription that was made by a computer before they, they were written, really. Uh, a number of years ago, in January 2020, it became mandatory to prescribe electronically, right? And now, 
all the doctors, most of the doctors prescribe electronically. We still see a couple of percentages of other prescriptions, but these are really exceptional cases and a number of them even are allowed. The patient doesn't have the prescription anymore. Um, older patients can ask for a, a printed prescription so that they can see all the data. Every prescription has its own unique uh, code, the RID code, eh, the Recipe Individual uh, Determinant Code that uh, identifies every line of prescription. So every product is a separate prescription. You can have it printed, you can even have it printed in the old-fashioned way, but most of the time it will be used either with your EID card, every Belgian and even people who are here uh, foreigners who are here for a longer time working, etc., they get an electronic identification card. You simply put in the card. There is nothing stored on the card, obviously, but the card is the key with which we can download all the individual information. And you also have a number of apps that you can use on which you can also visualize which are your prescriptions that you still have open. Behind this here is one of the stuff, and I didn't mention it on the slide, I should have maybe, is one of the, the, the little secrets that we have to run this thing, is what we call the SAM, Source Authentique des Médicaments, in good English, right? Uh, that's the original, the authentic source of medication, which is a database which is made by about five, six different official institutions, uh, the health insurance, uh, the, uh, the, uh, health, uh, the medicines agency, and other uh, agencies also. They all collect their data, and you have one official database where all the data for all the medication and some other similar products are uh, not only stored, maintained, so that you know, and everybody has mandatory, has to use this database, uh, which also contains all the unique identifiers that you need. Okay, when the patient goes to the pharmacy, the pharmacist simply installs the, card, the, the, the electronic uh, uh, identity card, and I see as a pharmacist, I see the whole list of everything that has been prescribed with the validity dates of the prescription, and if I click on one of them, I have all the metadata, so the pathology and stuff like that, instructions for the patient that I have. Advantage, I have all the prescription for the patient, might be a little bit of disadvantage that patients don't want to show everything. There is a system in which they can hide those prescriptions that they don't want to show to everybody, and then they simply basically have to show them with that unique barcode that you see that they are uh, guarding and that they can uh, use them for access. When I'm delivering the product, there is a second service that I have to call. The first one was to get the prescription in, during the, the moment where the prescription is coming in, the system recognizes which are the products, and depending on the product, I need insurance data. It might be the general insurance data, so that I know whether a product is in reimbursed or not, and in which tariff it is reimbursed. For a number of products, we need specific authorizations, the very expensive ones. In Belgium, we have a system where you have a separate authorization from the health insurance uh, saying this patient is allowed to have this product uh, in a reimbursed way. Uh, you have what they call member data. So some patients are in some care path, like for diabetes or renal failure, etc. So if they are recognized as being in that care path, automatically there is another tariff and there is another reimbursement, a better reimbursement. And last but not least, we have the MAF status, the maximum uh, invoice status, which means that from January 1st on, every uh, patient co-payment that you pay in the healthcare system is added, and if you get to a certain level, the level being defined also by your income level, but if you get to a certain level, you don't have to pay any uh, personal contributions anymore. This was a very good system, well, it's a, it's a bit of a brute system, but it's a good system to make sure that people who have the least income pay also only a limited amount of personal uh, intervention. But that means that every time that I'm delivering a product as a pharmacist, I need to check all these data to make sure that I can immediately uh, charge the right amount to the patient. Once that I have delivered, there is another little miracle happening. In the background, so I don't have to do anything for it, in the background, all the data of the delivery to the patient, including from which uh, pharmacy it was, from which doctor it is, at which date, etc., a lot of metadata, is sent to a central register, Pharmaflux, right? Uh, Pharmaflux was created by the pharmacists themselves. 
uh, and stores all the data that you need uh, if you want to look at the history, the delivering history. But you see here, it's just a list by date of all the boxes that the patient has had. I have uh, also as metadata the ATC level, ATC5, ATC1, I can choose any one, but most of the time we choose ATC5, which is the molecule, and ATC1, which is the very general description, is it for your heart or for your lungs or for your skin or something like that, which makes it easier to look at them. And within this system, Visually even, I immediately have a lot of information as a pharmacist, but I have to decode it. I mean, I have to read it. Red are the lines that have been delivered in another pharmacy. Black are the ones that I delivered myself. And by the way, it's really from all the pharmacies in Belgium that I see the deliveries uh, registered here. You can see whether or not it has been on prescription or without a prescription, uh, if there are uh, preparations, for instance. And once again, you see the possibilities to rank these products by ATC level if you really want to have a quicker look at what the patient really had. And these are the statistics. We started in 2014. We have about, well, I think 13 million uh, files of patients. The red little zone there are the ones that are really active and actively used. These are the prescriptions that have been delivered in the last 12 months. So the reason why you see an overlap here is that you have a number of patients that have had medicines before but didn't have one in 2023. Uh, or it could also be that they, have, that they are diseased and then uh, they are, they're still here but you don't see them. These are the ones that are really important and that we really see. So the, all the medication of the last 12 months delivered to the patient are immediately and readily visible for the, the pharmacist. Uh, with this system, we can do a lot of stuff extra. Uh, for instance, based on the different medications that patients have had, we will calculate their risk for a certain number of occasions. This is, for instance, PopVax, and the name says it itself, is a pop-up that we get when the vaccination season is running, and on which I can see for which reason, so based on a number of risk factors that have been determined based on the medication that the patient has had, he has had something for diabetes, for instance, then we know that probably he has diabetes, and that it's a risk factor, could be also his age, for instance, and stuff like that. Based on these risks, we calculate immediately and on the fly, so it's, it's instant, we see whether or not he needs to be vaccinated for the seasonal flu and for COVID vaccination. This is just one example of the pop-ups that we can generate here. Sometimes in other seasons, we can have other types of pop-ups that we have based on the history that we will work on and feed back immediately on the fly to the pharmacy what happens uh, with this patient. And then the fourth and last system, so we had the prescription, we had the reimbursement data, we had the history, and the fourth and last one that we have is the medication scheme, which is also very old. We used to make medication schemes. The medication scheme, by the way, is the list of medication that the patient is supposed to be using today, which is very useful if you go to the ER room, for instance, or you go to another doctor, or you go to another pharmacist even, to see immediately with one glance which are the products that somebody is using. And you have the way that the healthcare provider will see it, which most of the time now is still in this kind of a, uh, a, a roster uh, kind of way. But for the patients, we learned that it's much easier to use it uh, in a system where you can see, for instance, which are the medicines that you have to take in the morning, at lunch, in the evening, before you go to sleep. And then you have simply a list here. You can visualize them also in different ways. It's just data. So you can uh, visualize them in a number of ways that have been programmed. Um, so, this medication scheme is one of the most important tools that we have, uh, and nevertheless, it doesn't work well. It's flawed, and the reasons why it's flawed is, well, I've listed them here, a number of them, not all of them, but the first one, for instance, is making medication schemes is pretty labor-intensive. Also, maintaining them is pretty labor-intensive, because each time the doctor prescribes something new, or each time I deliver something new, uh, at least somebody, whether it be the doctor or me, should change the medication scheme, should add it. And it's not made automatically, he should add it to his medication scheme. Every once in a while, you have to check if there are no incompatibilities, for instance, of stir or medication that has been stopped and that you have to bar. So it's, a, it's pretty um, 
labor intensive and at the same time there is no specific remuneration for it. It's supposed to be part of your uh, being a global medicinal file GP which in Belgium means that you are really as a GP uh, the guardian of the medication file of your individual patient that you are taking care of. The reference pharmacist is more or less the same. So it means that you go to a certain pharmacy regularly and that that pharmacist also maintains uh, your uh, health data and your pharmaceutical data in a good way. It's part of that remuneration but it's not recognized as such and it's a lot more work basically than what you get for this, these two uh, functions. The second reason is that certainly if you go to complex instructions of prosologies, which means anything except the simple daily use, uh, one tablet in the morning, three tablets per day, that's a daily use. That's, that's pretty straightforward, that works. But once you get to the exceptions, once every two weeks, uh, use it only on Monday, Wednesday and Saturday, for instance, or you can start this medication after you have used this or that, all these types of medications, also the very complex one, if you have a, a diminishing dose like we very often have for um, uh, cortisone treatments for instance, all these are pretty difficult to put in a, in a useful way in these medication schemes. And last but not least, if you have a, a medicinal compounded uh, preparation, so a preparation made by the pharmacist, then it's a, I wouldn't say a disaster, but it's pretty difficult to, uh, to run this uh, on, on the medication scheme. And so that means that on general, even if we have about 3 million, I think, of these medication schemes, both in Flanders and in Wallonia, two different systems, by the way, but even if we have a lot of these medication schemes, there's a lot of distrust, basically, towards them. They exist. People will look at them and then very rapidly they will see that they are not up to date, they haven't been maintained for one reason or another. Some are okay, but a lot of them aren't either. So this is one of the big flaws that we have. And because of two reasons, these flaws on one hand, but also the fact that up until now you had to consult four different systems, there was, and then we are going to the next part, to the future part, there is a project that has been running for a certain time. It's called the VDIS uh, project. You see FIA, right? So it's the step also from the Belgium Khmer standard for exchanging data to the FIA standard. But at the same time, the VDIS project tries to reunite all these four together. And I will tell you also something about BIR, the Belgian Integrated Health Record, and the e -Health Action Plan, which has to do with it. But I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, what does VDIS do? Well, in essence, it brings together the services behind all these different, uh, these four different services that I show you, uh, also from the different regions and the different approaches that they have. We have been bringing together all these people to try to get to a virtual integrated drug information system. So the ambition first is not to say we're gonna make one big system on one big computer and then everything comes together. No, we leave the data and the systems where they are, but we try to virtually integrate them into a new process. And once again, and here you see it, the SAM, eh, the authentic source of medication, uh, plays also a very big uh, role. Ooh, this one uh, got botched up a little bit in the, in the treatment. But what it basically says, and it's not the whole image I see, is that for all the different stakeholders, uh, so not only the doctors, the pharmacists, but also the nurses, the hospital, etc., etc., VDIS will change stuff and hopefully will uh, improve stuff. And then what fell off uh, the image at the bottom here is all the different, uh, well, parts of the service, all the different functions, let's say, in the service that will be touched upon by this change. This is the very uh, graphic image of what we try to achieve. We had four different systems. We try virtually to integrate them into one process where everybody can put in data on this process and every medication basically has one line in this system. So that if a doctor prescribes, he generates a new line. When I deliver, I work on that line, I add information to that line. Um, either with uh, insurance data that are added to that line, either with the history, the delivery history, and even the place on the uh, medication scheme uh, is included in here. And all the way to the right, you see that there is also a journal function. So for the first time also, we'll have feedback from the patient who will on the same line 
for this medication that has been prescribed, be able to feed back information if necessary. I'm not using it anymore or I have side effects, whatever it is. And you see that all the processes from all the different stakeholders, also nursing home, for instance, or uh, home care nurses, uh, doctors and pharmacists, specialists and everybody, plays a role in this integrated uh, process. It's a project that has been running for a long time. Uh, we're still not completely there yet. I think it will take another year or even two uh, to uh, get to the end point. But it basically tries to reunite all these different local, regional services in the VDIS project. On top of that, in Belgium, you will recognize two initiatives. One exists already for a long time. Since 2013, we have an e-health action plan which in essence, I will show you an image of it immediately, tries to describe all the different projects that are running in e-health in general, everything together, right? Who is doing what, for what, and uh, until when. But we recognized a year ago, at the end of 2022, we recognized that there was not really a unique vision. We still saw that a lot of these projects were working one next to the other and they weren't integrated. So, uh, Minister van den Broeke, the, the uh, Minister of Social Affairs and, uh, and Health, uh, asked a number of uh, experts to write a conceptual description which has become the Belgian Integrated Health Record, so that document exists. Uh, for the moment, with a smaller group, we are trying now to implement it, which means that what we do is to try to take the principles that we described, we, they have already been added to the yield Action Plan, so that uh, hopefully, in the, all the different projects on this level, more and more this integrated approach uh, uh, comes through. And it goes very far. One of the things that we say in the bid, for instance, is to say there is no ownership of data. Nobody owns data. Not even the patient owns data. Because the doctor is the guardian of his data. And he has to control the data. Yes, when they're individual data, the patient has to have absolute control of his data. That's true. But if they are anonymized or if they're used secondary, etc., then it's not the patient anymore who has to say yes or no, except in some exceptions maybe, but yes or no, whether they be used. So it's, it goes very far. So this yield action plan, just to give you a flavor, has six uh, different uh, large parts, uh, uh, chapters on quality, uh, what the citizen has to expect, what the healthcare provider has to expect, how we can exchange data, certainly with hospitals, etc., and how we can include innovation, including artificial intelligence, and what we have to do to simplify the administrational tasks. And this is the whole plan. So this is the, the, the complete list of everything that we do. So these six chapters, the clusters, you see them here, uh, including a number of projects. So in, in all in all, there are 20 projects that have been identified and that have been uh, uh, described. The VDIS project that I showed you has a, uh, a part of that plan that is the description here, which says who is going to do what with VDIS and when do they have to uh, realize that. Also here, a list that's been botched a little bit, but there is a list of uh, a, a number of important uh, uh, um, actions and uh, projects that uh, are part of that yield action plan. VDIS, art artificial intelligence, fire, are amongst them, but there are a number of other ones also. I suppose that you will get the slides and that they will be better. And so the Belgian Integrated Health Record, it starts from the quintuple aim, which I hope you all know and recognize, which uh, is the general aim, what we have to do in uh, healthcare. And then the six objectives are essentially the same as the six objectives in the e-health action plan. In the beginning, they were a bit, a bit different, but it was confusing. So we aligned both the action plan and the BIR project uh, on the same thing. And these are the different uh, uh, objectives, let's say, that we have in BIR. I don't have time to go into detail with each and every one of them. Then otherwise, I, I come back for a half a day or a day, and I will explain to you if, if you want to. Right? In essence, what we did is take a lot of time for what we call primary use which is using these data around a patient to better treat the patient. But there's also a large chapter on secondary use, 
whether it be secondary use for scientific research, whether it be for population management, we've become more and more important, benchmarking, etc. Which means that every time you need different approaches of, I would say, anonymization and putting together these data for population management. We even look at population management at the, the small size of a practice or the small size of a very local region, a community, a city, let's say, uh, in, the, in the landscape. Right? Uh, and then the big highlights are oh, also uh, the, this, this thing does strange things with my, uh, with my slides. But uh, what we are working on for the moment is, for instance, a description in a number of cases of care sets. So these are the clinical building blocks uh, that the Dutch also use. So basic descriptions of what are the exact standards, what are the exact data that we want to exchange. Uh, we put them into care episodes also, and we use them like that. And one of the, the recent things that we have been doing is we had the SUMER, uh, the, the, the famous summary electronic health record, uh, which now has been uh, proposed to divide it in nine big blocks, because each of these blocks can be treated a little bit differently. Uh, I already showed you what we're going to do with medication in vitis, right? Uh, vaccination, for instance, certainly after COVID, works pretty, pretty well. Uh, very straightforward lab results and medical imaging, etc. That's not very difficult to combine in something that's useful for a healthcare provider to have rapid access to a, a quick overview and dive deeper if it's necessary. The biggest one is the, the first one, probably the problem list, which really describes uh, in uh, care episodes and with care sets what is really important to know about a patient. So that's what we are working on right now. This one should be one that's, uh, and, and I talked to one of the previous speakers, should be recognizable also. In Denmark, 6,000 different systems. I show you the number of uh, software packages that are here. Well, suppose that these are four different, uh, or three different, uh, sorry, um, uh, healthcare provider professions, right? You have the doctors and the pharmacists and, and the physiotherapists here. I only showed here that they use four different uh, software packages. In essence, the doctors have a, a couple of dozen, right? Pharmacists even have, have six or seven or eight, right? So they're even much more. But what we do today is to connect each and every one of them with each and every one of these different services. So it's easy to understand that if this is your architecture, you're always going to run into problems. Because it's enough that one of these software packages doesn't go along with any change that you uh, imply, and the whole thing, I wouldn't say implodes, but the whole thing runs uh, uh, amok. What we did with the pharma in the pharmacy, for instance, is to say, no, we make one what we call intermediate platform. This is the platform on which we have been storing these medication histories. This is the platform that makes that pop fax and stuff like that. During COVID, we developed six new services. The quickest one was in two weeks running in 4,500 pharmacies, period. It took us a week to put it up with testing, and after a week we rolled it out and it worked. Why? Well, very easy. These red lines, in essence, are a line between the software package and the intermediate, which in essence is an I.O. module. It's a module that says, this is the data that I can offer you, these are the data that I want to get from you, and since we have the description in the care set, they're pretty much standardized and it's easy to exchange. Not, not, a, not a big deal. And the complexity of consulting all these different services is over here. Because when these software packages ask information, this one goes and takes the information there, can even work on the information and send it back here. But these red lines are lines between, let's say, literally one person here and one person there, or one team left and one team right. And they can arrange these stuff. If there is something to be changed, they can do it. And it's a process which is, I would say, 100 times easier. So one of the propositions that we are doing for the moment is to say, wouldn't it be better if we try to work more along this type of uh, organization? So the last two very quickly, two slides, three slides. First one is I showed you that medication history. Personally, I think there is a lot more to be done by it. And there's a lot of resistance because they, some people really want to have a labor-intensive process to make that medication scheme. I claim it's not necessary. We have here 
a simple algorithm that makes all these different packages of products, which might be different quantities and stuff like that, different packages which translate them into what we call the virtual medicinal product. Right? That basically means bisoprolol 5 milligrams oral. Right? And so all the different packages that you might find in your history are translated simply into one line here. Right? Now, this is my medication history for the moment. I've been uh, having some trouble with my heart. By the way, I feel fine, so don't, no risk, don't, don't worry. Right? But this is what I'm taking for the moment. And this is my history, part of my history, because it's not, not completely visible here. But if I translate it, this comes out automatically, immediately. And if something changes, the next second, this list is adapted. It doesn't take any effort. Now, I claim that if I go with this list anywhere in the world, any physician will be able to read it. Because this is the basic information that he really needs. Right? The only thing that's lacking maybe is the dosage, the quantity, but we're working on that. I will show you immediately to add that. And if, for purposes of the, of the patient, for instance, I want to go back from this line to what he really used, we have all the information in the SAM to say these are the packages that you had in your history, and they, they even look like that. So we can translate that completely automatically into useful data immediately for the patient. And then the last one, working on pathologies, and then I finish. For the moment, we have dozens of ways to formulate a pathology, the instructions for the patient. Every system makes it differently. And the Americans have, with the uh, UMS, have a good system, I think, where they sta try to standardize it, but they don't really succeed in it. So you could impose a standard. What we are working on on a very small team for the moment is this process. Oh, it's also budget. But I, next time I use my own computer, it will be more visible for you. So we take the history once again, and we extract the pathologies, the instructions. We have them, but we don't use them in that system. They are there, millions of them, but we don't use them. We extract them. We put them together per molecule, per VMP, and we let an AI algorithm run on it and to extract the top five or top ten of the actually used um, uh, pathologies. We did a test, and AI is perfectly capable of telling you if I take millions of thousands, tens of thousands of dosages that have been used for patients, these are the ones that really are relevant. We can then simply uh, code them, standardize them and put them back in, offer them back into the system and say to the doctor, if you want to prescribe something, you simply click on one of them. If you want to do something else, you can still do it. You can still prescribe anything else if you want. But if you want to make your life easy, use any of those and automatically we will have coded and standardized 